first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of brief announcements. Um, yesterday, uh, the chair and our finance director were in House Appropriations Committee reviewing our GMCB, Green Mountain Care Board budget, um, and then in a couple of weeks we'll be in uh, Senate Appropriations and we'll look to schedule a time to present that information to the entire board as well as the public later in February. I wanted to give that update. Also, um, and I'm sure our uh, presenters will mention this today, I believe we didn't receive any public comments on the two open public comment periods we had. So I wanted to report that as well. And that is all I have to report today. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the, is the approval of the minutes of Wednesday, January 29th. I'm approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 29th on the additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And whenever you two are ready, take it away. Thank you. Um, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, GMCB Director of Strategy Operations. And I'm Kessler Health, Health Policy Director. Um, so thank you. Um, at the, thank you for having us back today at the January 22nd meeting. Uh, Agatha and I made preliminary staff recommendations on DEA's <coughs> proposed amendment to the 2019 and 2020 HIE plan, um, as well as on the FY 2020 vital budget adjustment, and we're coming back today um, with final recommendations to the board. Um, so first we'll review the, um, the proposed HIE plan amendment on consent. Um, we are, unless the board has questions, we won't walk back through um, our rationale and authorities um, and staff analysis. Um, we'll, we'll cut to the chase. Um, so we have a slightly revised proposal to recommend to the board. Um, following the board's questions on January 22nd, GMCB and DIVA staff have worked together um, to revise section 3A of the consent addendum uh, to more clearly describe permitted and non-permitted uh, uses of de-identified data. Um, this new language specifically disallows re-identification in addition to commercial use for sale. So that's the only change that um, we're recommending um, from the, the proposal. Um, and I've also included the slides uh, that we walked through on the 22nd, describing the reasoning behind our recommendation, um, but I won't go through this. Um, so as Susan mentioned, we received zero public comments, um, although a public comment period was open from the 22nd through this past Sunday, February 2nd. Um, and the staff recommendation is to uh, approve the revised 2019-2020 HIE strategic plan, including the HIE consent addendum with the change to section 3A that was presented earlier, um, and additional connectivity criteria documentation effective March 1st, 2020. Uh, staff further recommend sunsetting the 24, uh, 2014 HIE consent policy on February 29th, so that they won't be in conflict. Any questions? Right. Did you want to vote on these first the HIE plan and then vital, or together? I think we can do one at a time unless there's an objection to the board. Does somebody wish to make a motion? I move we approve the revised 2019-2020 HIE plan effective March 1st, 2020 with the replacement language identified uh, for section 3A of the HIE plan addendum and uh, moves that we sunset the 2014 HIV consent policy on February 29th, 2020. I'll second that. And just for clarification, uh, the section that you referenced is the de-identified data? Yes. Okay. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Board, um, Vital came at the end of January to request an adjustment to their budget order. Um, this is 
to, re to reflect the expanded scope of work under their new contract with DIVA. Their contract with DIVA is a calendar year, and their budget order is, is not on the same time frame. So this is showing the calendar year impact on their current approved budget. Um, so to remind the board, it's a $1.5 million increase in revenues with a corresponding increase in expenses, and it's directly related to the expanded scope of work. Are there any questions about the underlying information? Okay. Um, so this is just the background information. I'm uh, sure. So uh, as last time, um, so briefly, the staff assessment was that this budget adjustment continues to meet um, the criteria that we've set out for vital budget review. Um, it meets the, the transparency criteria um, in that vital has complied with all the budget guidance, has kept us informed about the possible need for budget adjustment, and has continually presented on their budget, among other things, quarterly. Um, in terms of alignment with HIE plan goals, the expanded scope of work that Agatha described um, supports the HIE plan goals, um, specifically um, through the, the HIE Consent Implementation and Collaborative Services Project. Um, the review timeline and uh, and process for developing collaboration with DIVA and VITAL to ensure that it would maintain contracting um, with DIVA or, or the DIVA federal approval process. Um, and lastly, we'll ensure that the, the order that results from this is sufficiently clear. So again, as Susan mentioned, we did not receive um, any public comment on this, so a public comment period is open. Um, and the staff recommendation remains um, that uh, we recommend approving the adjusted vital FY 2020 budget as presented with uh, one condition, and this is a condition that's, um, that we pulled over from the previous, from the original budget order to continue to have them do um, quarterly presentations um, on governance and operations, finances, technology, and the collaborative services project. Okay, any questions from the board? <coughs> Is there any public comment? <coughs> if not, is there any public comment? I move we approve the adjusted vital fiscal year 2020 budget as presented with the condition that vital present quarterly to the board for the duration of fiscal year 2020 and that vital's quarterly presentations include updated information regarding <coughs> operation, finances, and technology and the collaborative services initiative. I would just also clarify that the <coughs> operations would include uh, updates on consent implementation. I'll second. Okay, is there any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move to non-standard QHP design. Good afternoon. My name is Amber Navergelio with the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm here with Dana Houlihan from the Department of Remote Health Access. We are returning for you to discuss the non-standard QHP approval process and evaluation criteria to use uh, for approval of non-standard QHPs. We were last here on January 29th to present the process proposed process and proposed evaluation criteria. We had a period of public comment, a special public comment period open through Monday. Um, so we did not receive any additional comments beyond those we received at the January 29th meeting. Those comments on the 29th were um, a comment on what is the meaning of value within these processes? What is value and value for whom? And then we also had a suggestion that the board consider the overall number of plans on the exchange when determining the value of a non-standard plan design. These are the evaluation criteria that were proposed at the last meeting. For discussion today, we have the two suggestions about modifying the criteria from the proposed criteria. The first was raised by uh, board members, which was, should we include support of state healthcare reform efforts, uh, either as a standalone criterion or um, incorporated within 
number four, which is enhances innovation. We reviewed these two, um, sorry, and the second one would be, which was the public comment, overall number of plans on the exchange as its own criterion for um, within likely criteria number five about adding value to a Vermont marketplace. Um, as with the process and the evaluation the criteria development, uh, board staff worked with DFR and DIVA staff to consider these proposals and come to you with a recommendation. Our recommendation as it is, is to approve the process as presented on the 29th and um, approve the evalu evaluation criteria, which in some way reflects support of current healthcare reform efforts in the state. The reason why we did not include um, consideration <coughs> overall numbers of plant, overall number of plans on the exchange is that DIVA, as part of its statutory duties back um, here, before making a plan available on the exchange, the DIVA commissioner must determine that the plan is in the best interest of individuals and qualified employers in this state. And as part of that determination, DIVA does look at the number of plans on the exchange in determining whether, well, how many plans to have. So we did not feel it was necessary to include that as an additional criterion within the Green Mountain Care Board's process. So, um, at this point, we are seeking board feedback on where and how to incorporate support of state healthcare reform efforts, if the board wishes to include that. I think it's basically uh, just debating how to uh, do it, not what we're doing. It's just making sure that it's consistent with reform efforts. Does anybody have a preference on the board? Well, I do. So last, um, at our last meeting, one of the criteria was uh, enhance innovation, and then there was a section uh, having to do with examples. And I, uh, I thought that the, the examples were quite broad, um, and I'd like to try to focus them a little bit to um, align these non-standard QHP plans uh, with the all-payer model, um, which which um, uh, has not been uh, fully achieved. So um, to me, this is an annual cycle that, that we go through. Um, uh, this, these criteria are new, um, but I, I think that uh, you know, we're looking forward to uh, the 2021 QHP plans. In this instance, the non-standard plans, and uh, that's well into the all-pair model, and I think that there are opportunities for innovation uh, to uh, help, help align um, the, um, <clears throat> these plans with the all-pair model. And so uh, let me just give you uh, one example that, well, my proposal is to add to the language after the word location under criteria um, <clears throat> so that that section would read, promotes preventive health care, financial incentives, or optimal service delivery location consistent with and to the maximum feasible extent in support of the achievement of statewide health outcomes and quality of care targets as established in the Vermont ACO model agreement, especially those regarding chronic condition targets. So that's, I think, a very broad enabling statement or a set of examples. Um, but I'd just like to kind of walk through one that could be a possible for um, the folks that are working on this on these plans um, as, as, as it unfolds to um, improve what we have now. And the example I would use, and this is just an example, is di the Diabetes Protection Program. Um, we have the Department of Health's uh, statement that obviously um, pre-diabetes is a problem. Approximately 6% um, uh, of people have been diagnosed with it, and I'm quoting here, However, an additional 243,000 adults may have prediabetes and not know it. So it is a major, um, it, is a, it is a major morbidity that um, is, is um, highlighted uh, in the all-payer model. Um, and then I have, and the board has this information, and I don't make it available if anybody wants it. Um, the 
um, um, profile of and the, and the clinical assessment that of the CDC's program uh, dealing with diabetes prevention, uh, which covers both nutrition and, and fitness. And uh, it's, uh, according here again, uh, their program results in a 58% reduction in the development of type 2 diabetes compared to a control group over 2.8 years, a third group receiving metformin, which decreased the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 31%, but was less effective. Um, so the CDC program, I think, um, from what I've read, is the best standard uh, for a diabetes prevention program. And that's what we have in Vermont. The Blueprint runs a series of workshops um, <clears throat> that is based upon the uh, CDC uh, plan. But looking at their 1918-18 um, uh, annual report, there were only 184 graduates from that program. So we're dealing with a morbidity that affects morbidity that affects thousands and thousands of Vermonters, and we have a program, I, I think uh, a first-class program, in place with, with, with the blueprint, but it's just not getting uh, well used, and it's not in the mainstream of, um, of insurance policies. Um, <clears throat> so I'm looking um, kind of more broadly down the road, you know, that we have an opportunity um, to uh, revisit our benchmark plan, which was established um, under the Affordable Care Act in 2014 and has not been changed since. But there's much of that has happened in Vermont since then, and, and the possible kind of opening of that benchmark plan, uh, which the federal government now allows more flexibly uh, to see whether or not it's best aligned with the all payer model, I think would be a good thing to do. And the pre-diabetes program is just one option there that makes sense to me. And because you know, fitness is not an option under the uh, fitness efforts are not a strong option or even an option under the current benchmark plan, but nutrition is that that and understanding that these <coughs> criteria are dealing with payment methods and not the actual benefits because the benefit, there is a benefit in the existing benchmark plan with nutrition. To me, that might be, with some innovative minds thinking about it, a pathway to um, make this pre-diabetes prevention program more available through Vermonter, to Vermonters uh, th uh, through their insurance. And so um, <clears throat> that's kind of the background as to why you know, I'm kind of, uh, not kind of, I am proposing a, <laughs> A, uh, an expansion of the examples in the criteria to try to push this process toward aligning it um, with the all fair model. Okay, are there questions of the uh, panel before we go to a motion? Because I want to go to public comment before we do that. So, is there any, any questions or any comments from the board before we open it up to the public? Okay, is there anyone that wishes to comment from the public? Yes, Walter. I just want to know what the difference is in the line here. It says, change the applicability of a deductible to a service. Exactly what does that mean? Because aren't all medical procedures a service? I can't read what So I can answer that. Or okay. unless, Dana, you want to take it. I'd be happy to start with Right that. there. When they say applicability of a deductible, that means that the deductible would be uh, would be required um, under that under the um, structure of the plan for that service. So the deductible applies, for example, for a, an invasion service, but a, an a issuer could uh, opt to not apply a deductible to generic prescriptions, for example. That's that's what that language is describing. Who decides whether to apply it or not? Well, in the non-standard plans, which we're discussing here, that would be primarily the issuer's choice. And then based on the uh, plan design and structure, that they would have to um, still make sure that they comply within the ranges that are acceptable for um, their actuarial value. Deductibles are institutions passing costs on to the individuals. So I'm curious, again, is it <clears throat> every service or is it just this one or that one or that one or this one can they change can they not 
most services do apply towards the deductible. They, um, as a driver of care to uh, a certain type of service or to um, just make a plan more attractive, uh, the issuer could decide to not, to not apply the deductible, like I said, towards generic drugs or something else. Um, as a you know, as an incentive to you know, drive enrollment to that plan or um, drive the enrollees within that plan towards services in a in a certain way. So how does this add value to the market? Because deductibles are what keep people from using care. Yeah, so if I could just jump in. I, so these are evaluation criteria that we would use in evaluating the non-standard plan proposal. So this is a way of saying uh, we would want to understand uh, how the carrier is thinking about the cost sharing. So you couldn't, if you eliminated all deductibles, then your co-pays would be very high because you still need to meet the actuarial value right like that's a federal law that's not something that we as a board can change it's the ACA so it still has to meet uh, those AV levels bronze silver gold and platinum um, but what this criteria is saying is that part of what we will evaluate is whether or not we think that if the carrier is proposing to not charge a deductible for generic drugs or for uh, well colonoscopies are under the ACA so that's that's different I mean, that's required by federal law. But, or let's say they wanted to promote chronic disease management, so they wanted to say no co-pays or deductibles for the first three preventive care visits related to an X disease. So that we would be evaluating that based on these criteria. But it, it's not a way to eliminate all deductibles because quite frankly, there's no way to do that and necessarily meet the AV requirement. Mm. which we can't change. I mean, if you may be able to at a platinum level, but you're going to have to still then have co-pays because if, if you had no cost sharing, it would be 100% AV and it has to be 90%. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is there any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, would somebody wish to make a motion at this time? You want me to do it? Or? Go ahead, and I'll just uh, add my amendment. Or I can just add your amendment if you want. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so I move we approve the proposed non-standard plan proposal. Second. 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 Second specifically promotes preventive health care financial incentives or optimal service delivery location consistent with and to the maximum feasible extent in support of achievement of statewide health outcomes and quality care targets as established in the ACO model agreement, especially in regarding chronic conditions. Before somebody seconds it, let me just make sure as the presiding officer that I understand what you have just made for a motion. Where did you um, choose to add a separate criterion for the state health care reform efforts or did you include it with number four? I included it, I, I felt like I included it in number four with Tom's language. Okay, now I understand. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there a discussion? I just have a uh, one point I would like to make if others are interested. Uh, I think I would prefer, I like Tom's language and I like the direction it's going, um, to give it more staying power over time. I would like to change uh, the language to promotes preventative health care, financial incentives, or optimal service delivery location consistent with and to the maximum feasible extent in support of current health reform goals, with particular emphasis on statewide health outcomes and quality of care targets, especially those addressing chronic conditions. So effectively, I'm substituting current health reform goals with the Vermont's ACO model so that this, you know, as we may change the name of our next model agreement with the federal government, it just allows more staying power, I think, of this criteria. I, I would view that as a friendly amendment. 
Okay. It's been taken as a friendly amendment by the seconder, the maker of the motion. Yes. <laughs> Parliamentarian, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very much for having us today. Uh, I'm Marissa Parisi, I'm the Executive Director of Risemont Statewide based at One Care. Our team there is charged with helping uh, the, our network of providers implement Risemont Statewide. And as you know, um, Risemont started in Franklin Grandel counties at, in, at Northwestern Medical Center in 2015. And you had the opportunity to see them in action in October. So we were hoping we could come back um, to share with you more about how the Northwestern Medical Center team has really inspired us to spread the model statewide, but more importantly, also show you how we are measuring um, the work that we are doing to really hope that we can see some outcomes in keeping the population healthy. So I'm really pleased to be joined by this panel who traveled from all over the state to join us today. Um, Dr. Jennifer Laurent uh, works with us uh, at uh, the One Care office on the Rise Front team to really help us measure outcomes and make sure we are implement, implementing the evidence-based models so that we can look at um, indicators of whether or not we are on the right track with our prevention work. Um, this is obviously not a picture of Alice Stewart. She is here on our panel. This is, however, her preferred headshot. This is the wellness sloth at Mount Escutney Hospital. I will let you tell her more, tell you more about that. But uh, Alice is one of our early Rise Vermont program managers that started in 2018 when we started expanding statewide. And she'll tell you more about some programs happening in Windsor County. And uh, Billy Allard is here, who's also, um, she's an administrator, but an early adopter at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center of uh, the Rise Vermont expansion. And is gonna tell you a bit about how Rise Vermont's expanded in Bennington and some of the programs there. So this is where we're at right now um, with our Rise Vermont expansion. As you know, Northwestern Medical Center really set the tone and pace with Rise Vermont um, and helped create the evidence-based model we now uh, implement statewide. And from there, um, thanks to their incredible outreach and advocacy, um, before our team even started at One Care, we had five early adopter hospitals come on board to hire Rise Vermont program managers and take on the model in 2018. Last year, we had three additional hospitals join the program, Brownwood Memorial Hospital, Gifford Medical Center, and Springfield Hospital. And we do hope by the end of 2020 that we will uh, have a rise front presence in all 14 counties. That does not mean all towns in Vermont because we're very selective and strategic about the towns that we work in, um, especially because of readiness factors and health outcomes for, for the different communities we work in. But right now in 2020, we have um, pre-commitments from Rutland Regional Medical Center and Northern Counties Healthcare to hire a Rise Vermont program manager starting in um, sometime in quarter one, um, so before April. And then Grace Cottage Hospital um, has worked with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital to do some coverage in towns around that hospital. So we, I'm not sure that they will hire a program manager this year, but we are providing additional support through Brattleboro Memorial Hospital for towns around that hospital. And Central Vermont, we've been in close conversation with about um, whether or not Rise Vermont will come to Washington County this year. We are hopeful that we will be able to provide that level of support. And we've been working with the Thrive Committee, which is the Accountable Committee for Health, to just talk about what the options may be. So we're very hopeful that we will be able to bring the model to all 14 counties of Vermont by the end of 2020. And I don't want to take too much time to talk about what Rise Run is because I feel like the board has had a very good overview from various presentations we've brought to you. Um, and you have your more recent meeting uh, in October in St. Albans where you really got to see some of the work on the ground happen. Um, like many of us, you ended up dancing in schools and um, it sounds like there was no bike, but I'm sure there were other activities that you got to do. Um, but as of right now, we have 16 Rise Vermont program managers. So those are direct people in communities 
working on all different kinds of projects, which you'll hear about through the course of the presentation, at many different levels and many different sectors to round out the evidence-based model. We anticipate at least two more this year, if not four more with those other um, service areas coming on board. Um, you may have also seen, which is part of our model, um, a new campaign we've launched called Sweet Enough. Uh, and this is a campaign that is aimed at uh, behavior change marketing to help change behavior of a wider sector of the population beyond where we are just boots on the ground. So this campaign, um, which Dr. Laurent will cover more about the uh, pre-research and uh, evaluation we're doing of this campaign, is designed to help Vermonters make different choices around sugary beverages. Because while we um, are often known as the healthiest state in Vermont, we our research shows that people are drinking far more sugar calories than they should on a daily basis. And that does drive chronic disease, including diabetes, um, which we just heard a little bit about from, from the board. Um, we've also, since um, the middle of 2018, given out uh, over $220,000 in Amplify grants, which are grants directly to the community to do aligned work with Rise Vermont. And as you'll hear about today, we've, we've really developed a rigorous and comprehensive suite of program evaluation measures to look at um, how are we doing and to help guide our direction with Rise Vermont to ensure we're having impact. Um, and as I said, our goal at, by the end of 2020 is to have Rise Vermont in all 14 counties. Um, and I'll leave this slide with you, but I'm just more flagging some of the innovative programs on this slide that you may hear about in your own communities um, that are going on. <coughs> uh, having the network of Rise Vermont now, joint, uh, centrally coordinated by OneCare, is that all of our program managers are able to talk to one another that we facilitate on a monthly basis. So no one good idea stays in its location. It's able to be spread statewide. So these are some of the models we're going to talk about today. Um, many people are familiar with the EPODE model, which was the European model that inspired the work of Rise Vermont. Um, for our purposes today, though, we're really, we don't focus as much on EPODE because we um, see a lot of overlap with the evidence-based CDC-approved programs, including the socio-ecological model, um, collective impact, and the 21st strategies to reduce overweight and obesity. So we'll be looking at more of those today, but really uh, we often refer back to the EPODE model as our founding model. And the last piece that I wanted to cover before I hand it over to our panelists um, are questions that we've received about Rise Vermont uh, as we've gone forward in with our expansion, whether it be from the legislature, the community, our partners. So one that we get pretty often is, why is Rise Vermont part of the ACO and how is it funded? And Rise Vermont is the lead primary prevention initiative for One Care Vermont. Um, as we all know, it's a four quadrant model, um, and a long -term it's a long term strategy to reduce chronic illness among the population, which is the biggest driver of cost. So at One Care, the, the goal is really to have a plan for every person, and that includes people who are healthy or may believe they're healthy now but really have underlying health issues that they don't know about until you get a diagnosis. So what we're really trying to do is create the healthiest environments possible so that people have the greatest opportunity to be healthy. We are funded with delivery service reform funds, which right now can only flow to the ACO in Vermont. And from there, we feel a responsibility to make sure that all of those funds are coordinated and evidence-based to make sure we have statewide impact. So Rise Front is really the conduit to working with our partners statewide, and this is how we're gonna really hopefully measure the impact of the work we're doing and the impact of the dollars we're spending. And this is a, the last point is really, we find really critical, and we've seen, we've seen it out in the field as well, is that there does sometimes, there sometimes is a tendency with the medical community that they know that prevention is important, they know that 80% of healthcare is happening outside of the medical office, but if it's not there, if there's not someone in, in their office drawing them out into the community or helping them connect to the community, they may think that, oh, prevention is being taken care of somewhere else. So by placing the Rise Vermont program managers really at hospitals and in the clinical setting, we've really been able to draw health professionals and clinicians and, and practitioners out into the community to really meet people in a different environment and engage more in prevention work. So it's been a real, um, real benefit to have us uh, based at hospitals across the state. 
Um, the next one is, is Rise Vermont duplicating efforts? And I think that's a great question. Um, I, having worked in the nonprofit field for a long time before I came to One Care Vermont, would ask this question often, is that we need to do a very good job in Vermont coordinating efforts so that there is not duplication. And the Rise Vermont mission is to work together in Vermont's communities to improve the quality of life and build healthy environments where people live, work, learn, and play. And our number one value is partnership. We explicitly um, work with our program managers, work through our work plans to make sure that we amplify existing work before we launch anything new. So that may be um, we provide additional staffing or support or money to help local efforts that are already great, whether it's a municipality, an organization, even you know, key individuals. <coughs> we help further their work. And then when we see gaps, we fill gaps. Um, and providing that additional capacity for efforts um, it has been really important because we just are only trying to be in places where that capacity didn't exist before. So how are you impacting, measuring, or how are you measuring impact and outcomes? This I'm going to hand over more to our panel of experts, but I do want to say that measurement is built into everything we do at Rise Vermont. We look at um, all of the high-level population measure measures collected through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the Breakfast Survey, and the Census. And then we take a closer look programmatically because some of those um, larger population measures take a long time to see if they're making a difference. So we're trying to make sure there's a lot of rigor in our programmatic evaluation. Um, and then if anyone was interested in learning more, getting really deep into the details of our evidence-based models or how we're doing this evaluation work, you will have this presentation, but there is more on our website and I would encourage others with questions to take a look. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Laurent to talk more about the evaluation measures. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? We can, yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, I'm Dr. Jennifer Laurent. I'm an associate professor at the University of Vermont in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. And um, part of what I do there is obesity research and working at Rice Vermont. And so what I'm going to do today is kind of give you a very, um, I guess, brief overview of what we've been up to in terms of how do we best evaluate um, or evaluate our metrics to make sure that what we're doing is going to at least pay off over time. And I think as Marissa had mentioned, um, these preventative measures do take um, a fair amount of time to actually um, kind of show their benefits. So um, we look, we right, currently, we're doing many things, but this is just a snapshot of this slide um, telling you exactly, we look at population health, um, health trends, which Marissa had also talked about, and I'm going to walk you through each of these. We also have a study looking at um, the program managers, which are our key informants, and what they're doing, how they're doing it, and kind of associating some um, quantifiable measures with that. We're also, um, in Franklin Grand Isle, we're using that almost as a pilot community and really taking um, the time to do BMI surveillance um, in an objective way in our early, you know, early uh, childhood, so anywhere from like age six to 11, which really isn't currently done in the United States. Um, we're also um, tracking these amplified grants that Marissa had mentioned to see where our dollars are being spent and how we can quantify the dollars that are being used for our interventions to see how that might impact specific that we be seeing as we move on. Um, and then lastly, uh, looking at the behavior change marketing evaluation of the Sweet Enough campaign. So when we look at um, monitoring the uh, population health trends, this was gives you a snapshot. So as Marissa mentioned, we take the breakfast and the YRBS data, and we actually, along with the census data, we actually extract that so that communities have a really good snapshot of what's happening in their community. I think it means a lot to communities when they can actually see, oh, we're doing really well here, we need to work a little bit harder here. And this just gives you um, an idea of what we have on the website for each community and how we're using our population health data. Our key informant interviews, this was a group effort. Um, I can't actually um, 
take much uh, claim out of this one, but just to kind of give you a, an overview, we have about 75 projects in the state of Vermont that are active. Of those, 42 involve the community as a whole, which is pretty impressive. Um, and of those, 44 involve environmental changes. And as we know in sustainability, it's the environmental changes that really are gonna impact us most over the long term. Um, this, you know, this, again, this was a group effort, and we came together to figure out how can we really look at um, the efficacy of what we're doing. And, and this is kind of the, the holy grail of community-based work, is trying to figure out how to, how to make sure our efforts mean something, and we can account for the dollars that go into it. And so I feel like I'm stealing the thunder of my graduate student as I move on, because she, um, it, you know, she's not here today because she's taking care of patients, which she should be. But um, she really um, led us on the path of developing something, what we call just the dose metho uh, methodology. It's the methodology. And so this is um, something that actually started um, out in the Midwest. And um, they standardized by using um, some fairly advanced statistics to figure out how to quantify these measures so that we could say, if we were doing an intervention in a school, we could actually assign it a number. And then so all these interventions would be assigned a number and we could aggregate that data and actually give them a score. And that's called the CPPI index. Yeah, CPPI index. It's the Community Policy and Program Index. So it actually gives a number to, um, that has been shown to, as the number increases, as the CPPI index increases over um, about five to six years, that has been associated with a decrease in BMI in children. Um, so it's been studied, uh, uh, Kali Akers is probably the one who's studied this best, and it's in Kansas. Um, so we, we really have kind of um, adopted her methodology or her team's methodology um, going forward. This just kind of gives you a little idea, um, and, and um, one of our panelists is actually going to work you, walk you through the actual dose calculation, but I'm just going to kind of give you an overview here. This is a slide, it's a little blurry, but this is the CPPI index, and then this is the change in body mass index, which is basically the population health measure that we do to kind of evaluate who is obese, who is overweight, who is within normal range, and who is underweight. And so what we have found is that as the CP, CPPI index increases, there's actually a, um, a decrease in body mass index. And so the higher the strength or the higher this index has been actually shown to decrease BMI in a certain um, percentage or a certain unit by one or two units, which is a little bit difficult to translate um, with children because we look at other things besides just BMI to kind of determine whether they're overweight or obese. Um, so this was in 130 communities with over 14,000 children, they had key informant interviews and whatnot. Um, so it really has some good evidence behind it that we're adopting as we move forward. And so what we've done, if that's the next slide or not, oh, this, just, this is for your reference if you're really interested. Um, is really, uh, this is the grid that we use to calculate the CPPI index. Um, so we look at how long has that intervention been going on? How far is it reaching? Is it community-wide? Is it the whole health service area? Or is it just a grade, um, you know, a grade within a school? And what is the behavior change strategy? Um, I mean, we're looking specifically at um, the CDC strategies when we're collecting our data. Um, and so what we're doing is we're hoping, specifically in Franklin Grand Isle, because we have um, very good penetrance of Rise Vermont in Franklin Grand Isle, we're using that community as a pilot. And what we've done is we've instituted this BMI surveillance program that has gone through the um, Institutional Review Board, so it's been you know, um, vetted for making sure that we're you know, upstanding and we're holding true to the human ethics. And we're going into the elementary schools, and I think that we got all of the elementary schools in Franklin Grand Isle, and we actually had a wonderful team go in and measure the BMI of all of the children in grades one, three, and five in 2017. What we found out was 40% of the kids were overweight and 
weight of obese, which is way above what we're finding in terms of Vermont in general. So we've gone back in 2019, and I'll show you that slide. But what we're hoping to do is taking the dose calculation and really watching very closely the trends in BMI in the Franklin Grand Isle to see if really this adoption of using this CPPI index can actually really help inform and predict what type of BMI change we might see over time. Um, and that time is five, six, seven years. It's, it doesn't happen um, quickly, and I want to point that out. Um, okay, am I doing something wrong here? Oh, uh, there we go. So this is just a snapshot, um, and I, I need to stress that, um, especially as, a, as an obesity researcher, that um, I am impressed with what the, the statewide team could actually, or the actually the team that was able to collect this data. We collected data from, um, in 2017, from 1,600, uh, wait, 800, um, some odd students in grade one, three, and five, and we had very, very little pushback. There were very few parents who opted out of participating in their children, and then there were, um, there were even less children who refused to participate. So it kind of speaks to the um, fact that we can do this, we can do it very well, and this will actually really inform our efforts. Um, Did you get pushback from educators? We actually, um, again, this is just a pilot in one region, and we did not get pushback. We've, we, we feel like we need to give back to our superintendents at our school, so we have actually met with the superintendents, and we're about to meet with them about the 2019 data, to really talk about you know what's going on. And we have not, as far as I know, the superintendents haven't gotten any pushback, but we have not gotten any pushback from superintendents. And teachers feel fairly engaged because we have mechanisms in place to protect these kids, you know what I mean? So it's not like you just line up and get on a scale like maybe you did 20, 30 years ago. We have private booths, we have some very entertaining statewide, our, our team members who you know can divert attention. So it's been incredibly successful, the model that we're using. And it does align with other models that are being used throughout the country. Um, we're happy, I think re reluctantly happy to say that we didn't see an increase in BMI in two years. And considering the population statistics, I think that that's a very positive thing, that we didn't see an increase. We didn't see a decrease, but I think it also is too soon because we really started to increase our penetrance of Rise Vermont um, in Franklin Grand Isle, but also in the state in general. Um, oh, I thought that was going to be a question. So the other thing that we're um, hoping to do, or I'm hoping to do, is use these Amplify grants. And the Amplify grants are essential because anytime you're doing community-based work, you really can't tell a community what to do. Because, I mean, we don't, none of us like to be told what to do. Um, specifically, children don't like to be told, told what to do. Um, you know, so it's hard to get executives. You don't want to tell them what to do. So really, in all honesty, they have to self-identify. So this is the cool thing about our Amplify grants. And as Marissa had mentioned, um, $223,021 have been spent directly in the community for things that the community has identified that's important to them, whether it's a salad bar, whether it's working on a safe um, crosswalk to get to school. And so the community then becomes invested in making it a healthier community where they live, work, and play. Um, and so this also allows us um, eventually, and this is a particular interest of mine, is somehow fiscally looking at the association between the dose of what we're doing and how much that's costing and what we're seeing in our long-term outcomes. So that we can really say, you know, as we increase our dose, that those dollars can be accounted for in different ways. Um, and again, our grants are aligned with the CDC, so there's evidence behind that as well. Um, I think I had forget forgot to mention that in our key informant interviews, the statewide team is going out every six months to talk to these program managers to recap about what their current interventions are and to actually recalculate the dose. So it's really helped hold the, held the program managers very accountable to, um, you know, they know every six months that they have to be able to speak to what they're currently doing in their community, how that translates to dose, so that we can um, really kind of look at, okay, so maybe we should perhaps 
be looking at some high dose strategies. Again, um, one of our panels will walk through this and some low dose so that we get a nice mixture of community wide, there's some school, maybe there's a free yoga class. So we have a mixture and then looking at the fiscal impact um, of the money that we're spending on that. Um, a, a question about who in this instance oh, is the community? Like, who is making the decision at a community level? Uh, sure, sure. So for an identified brand, we have right now 36 identified towns um, that we are that we have rights want in, and we accept grants from community members in that town. There's a short grant application, and, and through that application, you, they need to identify what CDC strategies they believe that activity is going to hit so that we're collecting all of that information. The majority of the grant applications do come from the towns, but as all of us know, there tend to be hub communities, and to give you an example, Morrisville, it's a perfect hub community where there's some other small communities around it, but people shop or work in Morrisville. So we have, a, have accepted grants from surrounding communities where we might not be doing specific restaurant programming, but we know we're hitting all the same people. I guess my question was, so if it's the town, are you, do you mean the town manager, the select board, the community health team, or do that just varies? Do you mean in terms of the grants? Yes. It varies. We are open to, we've had grants from our state partners. We've had grants from individuals in the community, like the yoga teacher, um, schools, um, municipalities we've done grants for. So it, we are open. If there is a project that is aligned with these strategies and aligned with the work, we are open to funding it. So and lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about our most recent campaign called Sweet Enough, which is really addressing this um, really crazy problem with sugar intake in youth, but also in adults as well. So this actually doesn't really focus on youth, but the trickle down of adults drinking a lot of sugar sweet beverages certainly um, impacts youth consumption. And so. Um, what we um, did is, is we wanted to get, again, some preliminary data. Um, you know, Vermont is the healthiest um, state in the nation. So what are the healthiest state, what's, what are the Vermonters doing in terms of sugar sweet beverage consumption? And um, so we hired a, um, a firm to actually um, look at knowledge and beliefs and patterns. And so uh, what we did find is that um, on average, and these are adults, and the, the consumption in adolescents is much, much higher than this. But that on average, um, Vermonters are consuming about six and a half sugar sweet beverages um, a week. And in all honesty, that translates to a, about 2,000 extra calories. If you think about our daily caloric needs, most of us don't even need 2,000 calories per day. So you're talking about a great uh, contribution towards weight gain, but also not metabolic dysfunction, diabetes, um, and other health issues. Um, so we, you know, we identify that as something that really we need to um, change behaviors, give them alternatives, um, swaps, um, that type of thing, so that we can motivate them uh, with this um, social marketing campaign, behavior change, to really kind of look at their behaviors and think, oh, well, what can I do that you know would be easy, tasty, and whatever, so that I can um, reduce um, my caloric intake and also my chances of developing diabetes specifically. Um, so uh, we are, I think in the fall of 2020, we'll be collecting that post-campaign data, and so we'll be able to report back to you what we found there. Um, I have a question about that campaign. What was the involvement of the Vermont Department of Health? In the Sweet Enough campaign? Yes. We are, we are doing that campaign independently. We partner very closely with the Vermont Department of Health in all our activities, and especially locally. Our Rise Vermont program managers are very paired up with the district directors and are doing great work together. Um, we provided local materials for the Sweet Enough campaign. We've also um, been working with the um, beverage industry to identify some uh, convenience stores or places where people shop for their beverages who are actually willing to re-merchandise things to uh, include the sweet enough um, signage and then everything behind the signage, um, the goal is that nothing has uh, any sweetener in it at all. Thank you. I'm gonna hand this over to Alice Stewart. So 
I'm Alice Stewart. I'm the Rise Vermont Program Manager based out of Mount Estetany. I cover four towns, Windsor, West Windsor, Weathersfield, and Heartland. So I'm here today to talk about two of the projects that I'm working on. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is Health on the Shelf. And this is a project where we're trying to generate a sustainable supply of healthy foods in the area food shelves so that food shelf patrons who are trying to prevent or manage a chronic illness have some healthy options. And we're doing that in partnership with the food shelves. It's a very consultative, collaborative partnership. We've tried to be really careful as we're doing this work that we're respecting each food shelf's unique culture, capacity, and clientele. And then we're also recruiting local businesses, municipalities, and other organizations to sponsor food drives. So this is just a quick profile on the food shelves. As I mentioned, I'm working in four towns. There are five food shelves. The biggest takeaway from this slide is that these food shelves are very, very small, and that they rely heavily for their donations on area residents, and in some cases, area businesses who might give them a monetary donation. So the main goal, obviously, is to get the sustainable supply of healthy food, but we also have some secondary goals. One of those is community education around nutrition, and that goal is actually very important to our Vermont Department of Health partners. And then we're also using this act initiative to help build that accountable community for health mindset with our area businesses and other organizations. And the poster you can see on the screen there was designed by our statewide partners, who are super great. Um, and so we made copies of this for each of the food shelves so that when they get deliveries from us, they can put that up so their patrons know that those foods are available. So our key partners, I want to give a great shout out to Kate Rohn, who's the chronic disease designee out of the Springfield Office of Local Health. Kate's been with me every step of the way on this project. She's brought great resources and great thinking to it, and I really appreciate her help. And I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail now. So for the first phase of this project, what we really worked on was getting input from the food shelves, and then also some input from the clientele of the food shelves. So when we had this idea, when you have an idea, sometimes it's not a great idea. So we started out with the Windsor food shelf where we had a pre-existing relationship. And we talked to them about the idea, and they liked it. But the thing they brought up is, well, we need to be really careful about our volunteers. It's very hard to recruit and maintain food shelf volunteers. They tend to burn out. And if food shelves don't have volunteers, then they can't stay open. So we took that to heart. And so one of the big pain points for food shelves is the work that's required when they get food donations to go through and find all the expired food that gets donated and then throw it away. Sometimes up to 30% of the donations they get have to be thrown away. So we said, okay, we'll take that on. So I have some volunteers, like we have an AmeriCorps Vista at Mount Escutney in the Community Health Department. So when we work with our sponsors to these food drives and we get the food from them, we go through and cull out all the expired food before it goes to the food shelf. One of the other pieces that we do is we organize the food. We sort it all by what category it goes into. So you can see up there the different categories we were looking for, low sugar, low salt, whole grain, gluten-free, We've also added protein to that. So we categorize everything for them. So when we give them their allotment, they get boxes and bags that are all labeled for the different categories. And then we also give them an inventory where they have a list of the things we've given them and how many of each item. So that's one thing that we did to be really responsive. Uh, when we, before we got started, so we had the food shelves on board, they all liked the idea, but we also needed to find out what do the patrons think. And when Kate Rome and I first designed the survey, we designed it around what chronic illness do you have? And the manager at the Windsor Food Shelf looked at it, he's like, oh yeah, this is a good survey. And then he stops and he goes, well, what about Frank? Frank has diabetes. Frank doesn't care. Frank is not gonna eat low sugar foods. And so because of this great piece of feedback, we changed the question. And we changed it from what illnesses do you have to what healthy foods would you like if you could get access to them, what, what should we try to get for you? And I liked that because it also put that prevention angle into the survey. So now we're not just talking about people who are sick, but people who, for instance, maybe have a family history of diabetes or hypertension. And so they, are, they were able to give us input about the types of foods they wanted so that they could keep themselves and their families healthy. So moving on from that phase where we were talking to the food shelves and then we, and all the food shelves disseminated the survey for us and then we compiled all the data. Uh, in phase two, we've really been looking at sort of a quality improvement, small tests of change kind of approach because you can do a food drive and it can be a, not a very successful food drive. So we've been looking at different elements we can bring into these food drives to, to make them more successful. And part of the idea behind that is then we can go to new potential partners with a menu of things that we've tested out and have them tell us which of those things they think would work best 
for their environment, for their clientele, for their employees. So we've really been focusing on ways to generate donations because we need a sufficient flow of donations to make this sustainable, and then also making sure that we're getting the things that we actually need instead of just generic food donations. So I'm going to show you two examples that we've worked on. The first test we did was a shopping list. So we had the different categories of food that we were looking for and then some suggested foods under each of those categories. And then on the flip side, we put a food label with call outs. I think if we probably polled everybody in the room and said, okay, for something to qualify as low sugar, how many grams of sugar can it have? To qualify as low sodium, you know, how much sodium can it have? So this, by putting this food label on here, this goes back to that idea around the community education that I was talking about. This, really gives people an opportunity to think about what's in the food that they're buying, not just for the food shelf donation, but also for themselves. And then one of the things I wanted to highlight on the shopping list, you may notice there's some herbs and spices on there. We put that on there deliberately because cinnamon can help food taste sweeter, so somebody who's not having a lot of sugar in their food can put cinnamon on there and have it be tasty. Same thing if they're not going to have salt, having some other, you know, some spices in there can help replace that flavor and it makes it easier for people to stick to doing those foods that are better for them. And then this, this just started this week. This is our Heart Health Month. We're working with the banks in our towns, and we are doing gift trees with heart-shaped tags, and each one of the tags has a couple of food items on it. Each tag would run somebody about five or six dollars if they went to the store, and the idea is people pick up the tags, they go shopping, and then they can drop off their donations at any of the participating banks. And we based this off of a successful drive we did last summer for school supplies. Once again, working with the banks, we, put the, we talked to the school, found out what school supplies kids needed, and then for all the kids in our summer meals program, we were able to supply them with all the school supplies they needed for the beginning of the year using this model with the gift tags at the bank lobbies. So I have a planning and evaluation work group as part of my steering committee, and one of the things they've been working with me on is results-based accountability. So we've developed measures for the, the Health on the Shelf project. And you can see those first two measures are really focused on the organization sponsoring the food drives. And as I mentioned back at the beginning, we're really trying to make this sustainable. So the idea is we want an organization, whether it's a municipality, a group of banks, a major employer, to agree to sponsor a food drive on an annual basis. So that that way, every year, they're doing the food drive in February or May or whatever month. And so we want to measure that because if we go to somebody and they say yes the first year and no the second year, that means we're not doing a very good job, especially because we're talking about very small towns here. So there are a limited number of organizations that are big enough to sponsor a food drive. And then the last measure there is really focusing on whether we're collecting foods that people want. Because it doesn't really benefit the donor, the food shelf, or the people that go to the food shelf if we're collecting food that nobody wants. So I mentioned earlier that we give the food shelves an inventory so the Windsor Food Shelf, which is the largest of these food shelves, does actually track everything against the inventory. Nan, who works there, who's on my steering committee and Anne is on this planning and evaluation work group, came up with her own system that works for their food shelf where she does these color-coded stickers. So when we give them an allotment, she stickers everything and then, it, then they can tell at a glance what they've got that we've given them. If somebody comes in and on their seat, they're marked as somebody for low sugar, any one of the volunteers can tell by the color-coded stickers what they've got that's low sugar that might work for that patron. The other food shelves are a little too small to be able to manage to do that kind of inventory control, but they have given us plenty of anecdotal information. For example, we know that all the low sugar items went really quickly. They're in really high demand and it's hard for us to generate sufficient supplies of those. And then also that uh, another one, uh, piece of anecdotal, several people told me that the um, clients with celiac or who were otherwise sensitive to wheat when we started being able to offer the gluten-free items were very, very grateful because that's not something they've been seeing in the food shelves before. So we talked about dose earlier, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in dose. This was introduced to us at our retreat this summer, and then we had some nice in-depth training at our program manager's meeting in December. And my planning evaluation work group is really interested in dose. Um, I've described it to them, but this is my first take on dose, and we're actually meeting next week, and we're going to go over the dose calculations and see. They really want to see where we are in our whole portfolio for the, for the region. So just so you can see the total score on this one is the 2.55. The duration is high because these are ongoing food drives. The reach, I classified it as medium because it's based on the assumption that it's not just reaching the people in the food shelf getting the food, but it's reaching all of those people that are donating, all the people that are hearing our advertising, hearing our promotion for different healthy food items, hopefully reading the backs of the shopping list. And then the behavior change strategy, we ranked that as high because we're really looking at this as a systems change piece. 
we're really trying to change the donation system or we're adding to the current system and adding this piece onto it. And then I just wanted to share some really quick short-term outcomes. One is just the anecdotal piece that I have heard from donors that they are actually reading the backs of food labels and are kind of horrified at how hard it is to find low sugar items. Um, and then also that the Windsor Food Shelf has actually changed its buying practices as a result of participating in this project. They are now, with the money that they get when they buy canned vegetables, they are only buying no salt added vegetables, which I thought was a really great win. So the other project I wanted to talk about really briefly is the Windsor Walks project. And this is a project to develop a series of walking loops in and around downtown Windsor, varying in length from a quarter mile to four miles, and at least some of them to be negotiable by people of limited mobility or people with strollers. We're not talking about ADA compliant because quite frankly the infrastructure can't support it. But what we're trying to do is have some of the loops be like if you had a power chair and there's no ice out there, you could go for a walk with somebody. And we're doing that by partnering with the town of Windsor and our friends at the Vermont Department of Health. Once again, Kate Rome has been a really great partner on this. And then also, I've been working with several community consultants, and these range from avid walkers who are out there four or five miles a day, every day, no matter what the weather, to people with impaired mobility, because we're really trying to design a system that is going to work for a variety of Windsor residents. And the sample sign over there, that's the almost final design. If you notice, it's kind of long and skinny, and that's because when we went to the town manager with the original design, he liked it, and then he said, but the sidewalk snow plows are going to hit it. So we went back to the drawing board and designed this sort of long, skinny thing, and it, and it enables us to, each one of them will be custom, but we can, some of them will have the map, some won't, some of them will have the points of interest, some won't. It'll just like whatever pieces of information need to be on there, and one of the fun facts about this is the, um, we're going to be manufacturing them. We're partnering with the folks that make the Mamava nursing pods. And apparently in that nursing pod manufacturing process, they end up with a lot of scrap. So these signs are actually going to be made from Mamava scrap. <laughs> so it has this fun recycling angle to it. <laughs> so the primary goal of this project is obviously to get more people walking. If they're already walking, we're trying to get them to walk more. If they're not walking, we're trying to get them to think about walking using wayfinding and decision prompts. But there's a secondary goal here of trying to promote Windsor as a healthy place to live or visit or work. That's not typically the image that a lot of people have of the town of Windsor. And the town manager and the select board and a lot of people in town have been working really hard to help change the town's image. And we see this project as another way to help them do that. And I know you probably can't see it because it's kind of not, it's not easy to see, but that map there was put together by our friends at Southern Windsor County Regional Planning Commission. They've been doing the ArcGIS work for us. And that's just a preliminary map. There are actually several other neighborhoods that my community consultants would like us to expand to. So this is not a one and done project. We are going to keep iterating on this. In some cases, there's some trail work that once it happens, we can add some other pieces onto the loops. And uh, one of my key partners is Bob Haight, the zoning administrator. And you can see him there in the picture. We went out in November. We were shooting photos of where the signs were going to go. And, uh, can so, we see him? Yeah, he's got his legs in his hands. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, he's, uh, anyway, he's been, you know, when we first came to the town about this project, he was super excited and pulled out all these pieces of tissue paper because he had been working on not this exact idea, but something similar for some time. So using a Vermont Department of Health 3450 grant, which is what's paying for the signs, and my time as the Rise Vermont program manager, and Bob's vision, we've been able to really make this a really robust project that's involving a lot of different sectors in Windsor, and it's going to cover a lot of the territory in Windsor. And then this project does not have any results-based accountability, not because we didn't try. We've looked at it, I think, five times now in the planning and evaluation work group. We did the brainstorming, but we really had trouble finding measures we thought were really going to work. And so I've been talking with Denise Smith, who's sitting over here from our RISE statewide team. She's the one who does the key informant interviews. And so she's pointed me in a couple of promising directions on ways we might be able to get something measurable. We really want to be able to see what the impact is. Yes, we can do some convenient sampling surveys and things like that, but she's made some suggestions about you know, getting a laser pedestrian counter. Um, I did check with our regional planning commission after she said that they're too small, they don't have one, but they think they can borrow one from a bigger regional planning commission. Um, so anyway, you know, every, everybody's kind of pitching in to try to figure out how to do this. But I did want to highlight the dose score on this one. You know, the duration of these loops, some, many of them will be available even in the winter. The reach, it's, you know, because Windsor's one of the bigger towns, and also there's lots of people that work in Windsor, we, we anticipate quite a few people using these, especially because I have one of my community consultants has already offered to start walking groups once the loop loops are up and marked. 
And then for the behavior change strategy, I mean, we're making an environmental change here, and we actually really see it as a cultural change as well. We're really trying to change the culture around walking in winter. So I think that's everything I had. Please switch seats because I can't see the shirt. Last but not least, I'm from Southwestern Vermont. And um, I have um, worked at Southwestern Vermont for the last 10 years. And I have to tell you that um, certainly I've, I've had a long career as a registered nurse but the work that we've been doing for the last eight years that surround the accountable community of health is absolutely the most rewarding work of my career. And I feel more and more every day that we're going in the right direction and transforming care delivery in the state of Vermont. So um, I wanted Rise Vermont from the moment that I heard about it. And so I just want to tell you that story, John. Jonathan Billings, who's sitting in the audience, happened to present at a conference that we had in 2016. We were really excited about the population health work that we were doing and we wanted to share it across the state. And we invited all of the people that had gotten grant funding to come together. We had about 120 people there and had a day-long conference and small group discussions. And Jonathan did a presentation on Rise Vermont. And that day, our team from Bennington said, we need Rise Vermont. So at that point, I started hounding him and trying to figure <laughs> out how we could get Rise Vermont. So the fact that this group chose that as something for the whole state was just perfect. So um, we started before um, we could have Rise Vermont. We decided, OK, maybe we can't use that name, but that concept is what our community needs. So the Department of um, Public Health a leader and I uh, brainstormed after the conference and said, let's get a group of people together in our community and talk about this and see if we can get some enthusiasm. So this is not necessarily the group. <laughs> there were a lot of different ages. And, um, but we got about 20 people that started to meet on a monthly basis to talk about health in our community and what we, what we could do collectively to get the ball rolling with that. Um, Bennington County Challenges, you know it because you've heard about it for years. You know, we ranked 12th out of 14 counties with our health outcomes. We have uh, lots of poor people with housing issues, with food insecurity. We have many children living in single households and many living in poverty. And all of those things make us really want to focus on children and come up with a plan. And Rise Vermont has really given us an avenue to come together as a community to make this a reality. Um, we started again before we were able to start, so we used a summer intern that we got from one of the colleges to help us build momentum before we got the funding for Rise Vermont through One Care. And we started doing show up activities. We then hired Andrea Malinowski, who is our program manager, who has been a rock star and has done so much in the year and a half since she started that I would need a, a really long time to share with you all that she's done. Right out of the gate, Marissa and Emmy came down and met with us, and it was like a little pep rally, and we, we walked around the town, and they looked at all the people that were smoking, and we were brainstorming all of the things that we needed to make better with Rise Vermont. Um, our stakeholder group that we started with, we capped and expanded and grew it. And I have to tell you, our stakeholder group meets monthly, and we sometimes have 30 people there with all sorts of ideas. They are volunteering. They are covering all of the things in the community that we need help with. And it just has been so well received by uh, the community of Bennington. Um, this is uh, just a slide that kind of tells our story. Certainly, this is part of our accountable community of health that we're trying to put together. This is just a sampling of all of the people that 
are sitting at the table and that are really partnering with us, and this is just some of them, there's so many more. Uh, we work really, really closely with uh, uh, the Rise Vermont team, and they are always available for what we need. We have full support from Tom D and our executive management team to do this work, and um, that is Andrea with the green Rise Vermont t-shirt. And she, she just has gotten into every corner of the, of the community. She, no one says no to her. She's very convincing. And she can talk people into all sorts of things that really are making a huge difference in our community. One of the things I really want to talk about is the steering group. And um, I really wish that um, I could have had a camera videotaping our last meeting. Um, these are the people that are on our steering committee, and it, it's certainly Andrea and it's myself as the director of population health. We have the assistant superintendent of schools who is committed, who's at the table and really helping us get into the schools and do the work that needs to be done. We have the director of community development in the town of Bennington that is just really making a huge difference with um, helping to align all of us going in that same direction, sharing resources. We have the Director of Volunteer Services and Community Engagement, and that's helping us get volunteers, which feeds the programs and really gets it going. And critical part in the Department of Health. Uh, she started beside me shoulder to shoulder. There was turnover in that position. The next person was totally on board, and that has been critically important. And then United Counseling Services, which is our mental health arm, that's a whole other piece that we're working with them. And we're branching out into um, programs for people with depression and suicidation and people that uh, are isolated and alone and trying to get them to our, our special events. And then our business is the president of our local credit union, and he is helping us to gain support from all of our businesses in the community. So we kind of have this ideal team. And in our last meeting, we had just um, introduced the dosing um, measuring. And at that meeting, what we decided to do was take all of our events from last year and dose them now figuring it out, and also look at, besides dosing them, can we find other measures that we want to now put in place with our programs going forward? And they were on board, they're using their spare time to do this, it's not just that they come to a, a monthly meeting, but they're in it. And um, this is a picture of all of the program managers with the Rise Vermont team, and just imagine all the steering committees across the state that are doing this kind of work. It's just, it's just amazing and so, so powerful. We've given $30,000 in grants. We've touched every single corner. Some of the ones that I wanna highlight is we decided that we really wanted to start with young children and Head Start and early intervention. So we've had programs for those kids. We've also um, started a mindfulness program in kindergarten. So the kids and their teachers learn mindfulness and our hope is to measure behavior problems and kids that have to leave the classroom and see if over time laying that those foundation. Teaching skills to Washington. Pardon me? <laughs> I was wondering if you could transfer those teaching skills to Washington. Yes, I would love to. <laughs> if I had the opportunity, for sure. Um, so that, um, again, is something that's catching on. Now the businesses want mindfulness and the hospital just started um, Three times a month, we're doing programs for staff, for families of staff, for employees, for patients, whoever wants to come. So that is something really important. Um, you know, I think that uh, healthy eating and cooking is critical. Uh, we have an issue in our community with lots of people without affordable housing who sometimes are living in motel rooms with four, four children and don't have kitchen facilities. So we're coming up with creative ideas with Rise Vermont. We bought a whole bunch of crock pots. We're doing um, crock pot recipes with tasting um, uh, cooking times for those families so that we can really help them to better uh, feed their children in the circumstances that they're in right now. 
um, bicycle education. Um, we, we have like a lending library for bicycles, for snowshoes, for cross-country skis, for kids that don't have access to that equipment but really could benefit from it now. Free fitness classes are everywhere and they're spreading like wildfire and we're trying to make it fun so people that would always say no thank you are now doing it. And this was in the middle of the winter. It was about 10 below zero and a group in the hospital said, let's see how many of us will show up for our, our noontime walk. And there was quite a, a big group of us that did it. And that's the SBMC Wellness Walkers. And our new uh, year-long uh, program just started, so we're gonna be out there a lot. Community show-up events, this is a critical piece. Our dream is that every Friday during the school year, kids will get a list of free activities that would have healthy snacks and access to some sort of exercise and activity, and they would be free so that we can get people out of their homes and to these activities. And our numbers are going up and up and up with the people that are getting involved. We also have a special program starting for the summertime where they're gonna have a passport and we're gonna have kids in all the schools get the passport for, um, I believe it's gonna be fifth grade through eighth grade, fourth grade through eighth grade and there's going to be prizes at the end of the summer when they return in September and show us all the great stuff that they did. Um, this is really action in the right direction. We're, we're now infiltrating businesses, infiltrating schools. Um, Andrea is on the wellness committee for the school system, and right now we're this close to getting approved um, that no longer will taking away recess be a practice in the school system. Because kids need that activity, and to take that away probably doesn't really help their behaviors, and we've, it's taken us a while to get teachers on board and administrators on board, but it appears that we are. No longer can food be used as a reward, and we're changing what birthday party celebrations will be and including activity, physical activity, and healthy food. And so all of those kinds of things are really changing the way that we um, work in the schools, the way we work in the community. Integration in the community. Um, right out of the gate, one of the first things that we did as a stakeholder group is we sent a contingent of our members to a select board to say, could you please make decisions from now on based on health? And they looked at us kind of like, what are you talking about? And we had a whole long list of the kinds of things. We need sidewalks, we need playgrounds, we need um, safe pathways for bicycles and, and places for people to walk. We need walking trails and we need um, we need you to understand and partner with us on this journey. And so much progress has been made since that first uh, meeting. We're at the select boards a lot. We have a, a respectful relationship with them and with the community. And we really are leveraging long lasting change in our community. Um, we also um, are starting to um, place various people on various boards so that we can have a presence with decision making in the places that really are going to make a difference to improve health in our community. Future plans, um, Andrea, who you just saw, just finished her pre-diabetes training in Newport. In Newport, she didn't know Vermont went so close to Canada <laughs> when she drove to that program last week, but she's ready um, to help with our pre-diabetes program. We had three um, one-year cohorts of that program over the past year. Um, we're certainly working with doctors to give more and more referrals, so I totally agree with the sentiment that that program is critical and we need more patients getting involved in it. But one thing we did um, new and different this year is we added exercise. So we did that program um, sometimes doing physical activity at the same time, and the people had improved results with weight loss and with decreasing their A1C, which is the measurement for diabetes. 
So Andrea is positioned in a perfect place right now. She helped do that program with the exercise, and now we're going to connect the dots. And hopefully next year you'll have much more people in that program, and we can share that data with you. Um, these are the other things. Food pharmacy is a new program that we're doing. That's also targeting diabetes, and that's with Tiffany Tobin from our, our um, food service department at the hospital. No food is being wasted in our services right now. We make food, st soup, stews, casseroles, and bring them um, periodically to the food shelters, um, to the uh, low-cost housing areas. And now this program is going to provide um, a family of four with food for five days of the week, predicated on healthy food with the goal of decreasing their A1C and helping to change the health habits of that family. So we're writing grants right now, and we're ready to go with that program, and RISE Vermont is right there beside us with it. We're also trying to connect healthcare workers in the schools to do much more um, health curriculum. There's very little in the schools right now and they desperately need it. And if we offer up our services to do that for them, they seem able to fit it in to the curriculum. So that is another exciting plan for the future. So in closing, um, I really have found from the moment I heard about it that Rise Vermont was going to be a catalyst for change in our community and it truly has been. Um, you know, I think uh, I've only been in Bennington for 10 years working. I live uh, across the border in Massachusetts, but from what I understand, generations of families have been unhealthy and, and poor in our community, and we're trying to break that cycle. And so we're really starting with the children, and I'm hoping, you know, a generation from now, we're really going to see that we're, re we're really laying the foundation for a healthier future. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions? Questions from the board? I just have two, I think. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you, you know, when you come and present your passion and creativity for all the work that you do in Vermont. It's very much appreciated. And a lot of these innovations, I'm hoping, will spread once you, you know, learn if these are actually working. And I appreciate the attempt at evaluation and metrics to, to think about that. Um, maybe this is maybe best for Marissa, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm trying to understand how you all think about balancing local control and desire for autonomy in the community in designing programs with uh, you know, a more standardized, centralized approach based on best practices, what you've learned in other places throughout the state or elsewhere, you know, uh, to think about what kind of programming you want to fund and want to manage and oversee. And I'm thinking about in the slide going up with the 75 projects going all over, planting lots of seeds right now to see what is going to grow. At what point do you think that you might, or will you ever, narrow it down and say, hey, 75 is a lot. These are the top X, I don't know what the number is, that seem to be working. Let's focus in on those. How, how do you balance that and think about that? As you're expanding. It's a great question. I'm not sure I've asked myself that yet, to be honest, um, because we have been in startup mode for two years, right? Uh, um, but what's most, I think what is most important to us is find, striking the right balance with ensuring we are implementing an evidence-based model, right? We want to be able to measure outcomes and really know that the dollars we're investing in prevention are going to get us where we want to be, which is healthier communities, people not having as much chronic illness. However, in Vermont, um, people really want to do what's right for their community in their own way. And so what we've really worked on doing is honoring that, and I think specifically using those CDC strategies um, to identify like the grants is, is a really core way that we help support the community do what they want to do in their way, but we do ask them to tie it back to those CDC strategies because they're evidence-based and we know that they will have an impact. They may be creative, and I think there will be things that are unsuccessful, and we will have to just know not to repeat those. And we, since we're in the startup phase, I think it is going to take us a little bit more time, but that's why we're doing so much evaluation is to not repeat, try to not repeat things that we find in front aren't, aren't successful. Um, and my second question is around, there was a slide you had in here around 
making sure, is, is rising around duplicating efforts. Um, and you mentioned in here uh, uh, doing extensive assessment in communities and working with state partners. And so I'm wondering, and this to some degree relates to HRAP, the Health Resource Allocation Plan that the board is responsible for updating. I'm actually wondering about your assessment that you're doing in each community to assess need and whether it's standardized in every single community, you're asking the same basic questions, you're looking at the same population health metrics, you're assessing what the needs are, and then using that assessment to figure out what is going to be the best programmatic investment to address those needs. But I'm wondering about that assessment process. And what we might learn from it as we're building HRAP, to be honest. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's twofold. One, yes, it's standardized. Those initial sheets you saw that are the county snapshots show uh, it's really hard to get that real granular town level data. That, that's one issue. Um, but we do our best to get some town level data. And we do use a standardized um, method to have our program managers kind of do an assessment of, of all the towns and as much data as we can collect about their health outcomes, food security, transportation, that type of thing. And then they look at all of that qualitative data about the demographics and what's going on in the communities in their health service area. But then there is always a second part of it that is harder to quantify, and that is a readiness factor. Because um, Rise Vermont, beautifully designed, well-branded, thanks to the startup work of Northwestern Medical Center, and it was homegrown in St. Albans, Vermont. And they're very proud of it, it was homegrown there. But other communities want to feel like they're home, that Rise Vermont is homegrown in their community, just like Billy has shared about Bennington, that they were excited about it, but they did the work to create their own, what Rise Vermont was gonna look like for them within the model. Um, so what we often have to do is a lot of just asking people, do you think this is something your community would want or is ready for? So we have to look at the data and say, we often know exactly where to go from the data, but whether or not the town would want us there, we have to respect that as well. So we do a lot of just relational work of just asking questions, doing interviews in the community, of, is this something you would like to start in your community because you're ready for it? So it's two parts. One is more scientific than the other. Actually, I do have a third question. Speaking of scientific. One, one last thing related to the first question. Um, our steering team really liked looking at the list of CDC um, guidelines. And that really helped us to go through as kind of a cross-community group and look at the things that are being taken care of by something else already in our community. And it helped us to hone into what is missing that Rise Vermont needs to get involved with. So I think that that could be different community to community and lends itself to sometimes choosing different priorities going forward. Right, that makes sense. Um, with the dosing of the CPI, I'm just wondering, as you were describing how you were categorizing some of these interventions, I'm wondering how do you ensure that how you categorize them are more objective, less subjective, more evidence-based, I and mean, putting something in a high category versus a medium category. I know there's some guidelines here, but um, I just I don't know if I can flip back to that slide. Um, I mean, to me, so for example, behavior change strategy, putting implementing universal free school meals in the same category as trail signage, I, I, I don't know. So how, how do you decide that they're both? There's actually, um, because that's a, really, that's a really good question, and, and again, that's one of those things that's really, really hard to quantify. So what the what Kali Akers and her group did is they really were looking at ranges. And again, this is this isn't you know that exact statistical estimate, but it gives you this range of um, things that you quantify in terms of uh, reach dose. Keep going, reach dose and um, and behavior change. So it really kind of gives you an idea. We've looked at several that are similar to the CPPI, but this fits a little bit better with those homegrown community-based initiatives, where they're all very different, but it allows us to really look at, so the estimated population that we've reached, and then it gives you examples of different types, like so if you were gonna 
quantify something as a behavior change change strategy that was high, it would be like almost from a systems level, you know, those policies, um, you know, access, infrastructure, all that kind of stuff that increases behavior change. Whereas low, which is cut off down here, is just that informational type of, um, of things that you're delivering. So you actually get this aggregate score out of it. And again, it's, um, we haven't adopt. We we think it's going to be a good fit for Vermont. We don't know if it's going to be a good fit for Vermont, but it's really kind of the 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 best that's out there in terms of how to actually assign a number to what we're doing and then track that number over time in relationship to what's happening with our specifically our BMI in the state. So it's not a great answer, but it's it's the best that. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of population health research is that it's messy, <laughs> um, which doesn't work great, really. Oh, thank you. That's 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 your yes, yes. Do you ever tie the allocation of resources to a specific community program to outcomes? Well, that's our, I think, you, that's our long-range goal. That is definitely our long-range goal. Um, when you say long-range. Well, long range because, you know, um, first of all, tracking um, outcome measures are hard to track. You know, you have to have some uh, objective outcome measure. We're choosing BMI. It's, a, it's there, but it's probably not the best. So it's going to take us a long time, you know, several years to figure out the fiscal impact versus, you know, the intensity of the intervention. Um, is, that, is that what you're getting at? Well, uh, what I'm getting at is, let's say the community is going in the wrong direction with BMI, for example. Um, right. Have you explicitly told them that, you know, if you're not meeting the outcomes, that you will not have future funding? No. <laughs> because, um, and I say that so frankly, because what we're, what Rise Vermont tries to be about is uh, really tapping into that community energy for wellness. And I would say, um, we're very lucky to see the outcomes in St. Albans, but that there are many towns in Vermont that the BMI is going in the wrong direction. And there's quite a few years of behavior change and systems change around those individuals and those children to get them on a better track. So I think probably over time, we will see BMIs continue to get worse until they get better. Um, but we don't ever want a community to feel like, if you don't get better, you will be penalized by, by losing funding from us. We are really here to cheerlead, support, and move forward communities. And they may not do well for a little while, um, but we'll track that and continue to coach them and provide resources to, to turn things around. You know, we hear repeatedly from um, legislators and others that want immediate results, and uh, they're continuing to press us as a regulator to try to find ways to assess the effectiveness of different programs that One Care is putting out there. And I would just encourage you to try to, um, you know maybe shorten the time frame of what you think your goals are to start um, reaching them because um, I don't think time is on our side. I think that uh, there's a, a huge argument being made out there that traditionally every uh, community in the state had a recreation program. Um, it was paid for with local tax dollars. They encouraged swimming, basketball, you name it. And um, is this just one more um, reach out for someone else to pay for that. And if you can't prove your results, it's going to be hard to justify the funding. It's just my advice to you. Thank you for that. And I assure you that is our goal. We would love to see results sooner. And that's why we're staying as plugged in as we possibly can with this rigorous evaluation model we've shared. Um, we will have results of the Sweet Enough campaign within the next 12 months. Um, and we feel really good that we will see some results there. And anything we have, real time when we have it, we are publishing it and sharing it. Um, the way, though, that I have framed um, the prevention efforts for One Care, which is the smallest investment at uh, less than 1% of One Care's budget, all of this incredible work that's going on statewide, is this is the long term strategy. And I think about it, um, my father in law is a CPA, and in my 20s, he said, make sure you start contributing to your retirement, because the dollars you put in now are going to work the hardest for you later. 
and that's what we're doing here. The dollars, the small amount of dollars that we're putting in now to rise Vermont and prevention initiatives and the incredible work of our team, that is what's gonna pay off for the long term. <laughs> And it, it, we really have to be looking at both our short-term results, but then also how are we just going to completely change the track we're on. But they only pay off if you get behavioral changes that last a lifetime. And that's Absolutely. one of the things that's, you know, I remember 20 years ago being on a school board trying to uh, put in place lifetime sports that, that um, people could fall in love with and do throughout the course of their lifetime. And so, uh, you know, just to give you an example, um, we here are always tracking total cost of care across hospital service areas. And uh, when hospitals come into us at budget time, uh, you can almost give the speech for them. The reason why they need more is because the demographics are bad in their area. They have high smoking, they have high obesity. Um, you know, it's a canned speech, and yet, um, the problem is that you can't use it as an excuse. You have to use that as something that you start to try to turn around in a community, which is what RISE is trying to do to assist in that. And, you know, I just, uh, I worry that if we're not more conscious of trying to demonstrate what results are, that everything will fall apart, so. Thank you for that. Tom. So my question is in the same uh, genre as Jess's and Kevin's. Um, if you can flip uh, to the chart that is uh, that shows the trend lines of, of, from the healthy community study, it's, it's either one up or one down from the one that you were just on. Um, so I'm just curious as to, uh, <clears throat> there was this healthy community study, it was over a six year period, there were 130 communities, thousands of participants, so that's a fairly large base in order to build a statistical uh, relationship and um, I'm just wondering what, uh, what is the statistic that drew you to this? Uh, in terms of those those trend lines, and you know, if it was a regression model, you know, what was the R value that um, that uh, that that drew you to it? And and, and given the, the largeness of, of of this study relative to anything you're going to face in Vermont, as you get to smaller and smaller communities, how does this model apply as the population that you have uh, is diminished, and therefore there's a, a you know a wide wider margin of error? Um, so we chose this as an evidence-based model. So we, we don't actually know if it will work in Vermont. Then it's evidence-based that it works for them. It's been shown to decrease BMI significantly over six years. It's probably the, the best model out there that we could find to try and quantify, you know, how much intensity is enough intensity to, you know, get whatever behavior change or outcomes we want. Um, without overshooting and spending too much money or fiscal dollars or whatever. Um, so we don't know that this is what's going to happen. That's what we're hoping. And the evidence shows, based on the work done in Kansas and in the Midwest, is that statistically, when they had a higher level of intensity, there was a drop in BMI. So um, we have, and, and what we're hoping to do, and, and we only have two um, time points for our Franklin Grand Isle, is, is really using this model in association with some of my, you know, my statistician colleagues, is really look at some forecasting efforts. If we can take all of the data that we have to say, okay, you know what, we can give you all the stats and everything, we can give you what we're doing based on this particular model and dose, we can forecast out three, five, ten years to see, you know, what it might look for Vermont. We, you know, that's that's a huge work in progress right now, and we're just and kind of really at the infancy. For Vermont, um, as opposed to um, a, a subset of communities, I'm, I'm just wondering. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what we're hoping to do, um, it, it gets a little, again, muddy, because what we're hoping to do, so we have really excellent Franklin Grand Isle data. 
Um, with the ACO kind of incorporating more and more um, counties in Vermont, we're hoping to actually be able to um, mine that data and be able to get BMI in kids and be able to look at, use that as kind of a marker of other communities within Vermont. Right now, um, I think the analyst um, thought that that might be something, but again, it's a little messy of how it's reported in um, through VITAL. And but, not, not the um, but that's that's just kind of a, a secondary way that we're, because we understand that we can't do this type of intensive monitoring all over Vermont. We don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the money, we don't have the resources. Um, so we're trying to figure out a marker that we can actually use it so that we could then use this to model for Vermont. We probably could, in another two years, model it for Franklin Grand Isle, but that's just a snapshot of Vermont. And so really using what we currently have to, and, and some advanced statistical modeling to look forward. So if we can achieve this type of dose, you know, which is around 0.8, I think, is the high intensity, you know, what might that look for other communities? Sure. So this is just from a, from a program manager's perspective. Obviously, I don't have a bank of statisticians. <laughs> But by using the DOSE methodology, it helps a local program manager assess the portfolio of projects that they're working on. Because if everything you're working on is down in that low DOSE, then you need to rethink what you're allocating your time to. So that's how I see it as a valuable tool, and that's why my planning and evaluation work group is really interested. And it's okay if not everything is way up here and high, you know, because you want to have a mix of strategies. But if you think about it from that perspective, when, when we got the presentation this summer, Brianna, the nursing, um, the doctor of nursing student who did the research, showed us several different models. And as she went through the other ones, everybody in the room was kind of like, mm -hmm. and when they got to this one, all of a sudden everybody was like, oh. And you could sort of feel it in the room that everybody got it, and it made sense. And I think that's why we feel as program managers that it is a potentially good fit. And we did, it's true, we don't know yet until we start really using it and figuring it out. But for right now, it seems like a really helpful tool for us. Other questions from the board? If not, we'll open it up to public comment. Yes, Susan. Um, Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. Could you turn to slide seven, please? funds, which can only flow to the ACO. So I just feel compelled to clarify this for the record. I'm not sure where you guys got your information, but for the sake of true truth, because I do believe truth matters, I'm holding in my hand the uh, menu of approvable delivery system reform investments. This comes directly from Vermont's global commitment Medicaid waiver. These delivery system reform dollars, it doesn't mention in that slide, are Medicaid, pure Medicaid. And right in our waiver, it says that these dollars were intended for two types of organizations in ACO and the organizations that are on what we in Vermont used to call the Medicaid pathway. Those Medicaid pathway organizations are defined as the following providers, um, Medicaid community-based providers, including designated mental health, disability support, substance use disorder providers, and long-term services and support providers. So that statement that it's funded with delivery service funds which can only flow to the ACO is just patently wrong. I know One Care has made similar statements in legislative committees. I hope it chooses to provide true and accurate information to the public going forward. And I think the Green Mountain Care Board, which is on record as reaching out to the legislature and the governor to direct more of these delivery system reform dollars to One Care, can appreciate the fact that these dollars were intended to support the community-based agencies that support people living in communities with disabilities, Medicaid dollars, and none of them have gone from the Agency of Human Services, uh, DIVA, directly 
to the organizations that were intended to benefit when, and when representatives from the Green Mountain Care Board in the past were sort of selling this to the Joint Health Overcare, uh, Joint Health Care Committee in 2016, presented charts showing this is a permission slip and these funds will be available for the Medicaid pathway. Well, to date, none of the funds have gone directly to the Medicaid pathway organizations. Um, hopefully the legislature might clean that up, but I would just request respectfully of One Care and Rise Vermont in the future to please put out accurate information. Those funds, it says right there, can only flow to the ACO. That is just not true. Okay, other members of the public. Any comment? Yes. Um, Jeff Batista, State Auditor's Office. Um, but in a previous lifetime, I was a uh, doctoral candidate studying socioeconomic factors and how that motivates people to walk and how that affects their obesity. So kindred spirits right here. Uh, a couple of methodological questions. Um, if you can go back to that graph showing the different ethnicities and the impact of community interventions. I'm concerned by the um, difference in performance among different ethnicities. Mm -hmm. I understand that Vermont is, I'm guessing, 95% uh, white by census data, uh, however you define that. But if this is how community uh, interventions, based on the model you're using, impact populations, then we would expect less uh, robust results among uh, the, some of the least advantaged people or the least represented people in the population. Um, how would you compensate for that? Well, you're absolutely correct. Um, and I, I, I don't have a really good answer as to how I would compensate for that. I think it's a flaw in the majority of the, you know, the research that we do. Um, and I think it, it does point, um, like you had mentioned, to the social determinants of health. I mean, until we actually really address the underpinning of why we even need an intervention like this, it's only just a small piece. And so, you know, to really look at how we're gonna actually change um, BMI in those who are at higher risk and probably higher risk for comorbidities like diabetes and, and you know, the, um, the African-American and Hispanic populations. But, you know, BMI and obesity, um, I always think of it as a driving force behind chronic conditions, but the social determinants of health are the driving force behind obesity to a large extent. And there are, you know, and there's genetic, you know, familial, all sorts of influences. So it's not a perfect method that we're adopting. And um, hopefully as we change our diversity within Vermont, and we're all hopeful that that will happen, that we're going to have to really think about new and different ways of, of um, you know, aiming our interventions or targets to those populations that perhaps may not be affected as much. And I guess I'm also hopeful because our communities are identifying these strategies for us. So as our communities become more diverse, the hope is that the efforts of that diverse community will therefore help you know, reduce, um, well, in this instance, the BMI, but increase the health of that community. Does that make, so it's, it's it, you know, I think we have to have those, that's why it's so important that we are putting the dollars and the choice in that particular community, whatever ethnicity it might be. Okay. Uh, following up on that, uh, some of the questions are already brought up by the board. And I'll read this because I prepared it this morning after looking at it on the website. Um, obesity depends on countless factors, right? And while evidence-based models are great to guide program design, they don't prove a causal link between RISE, Vermont's initiatives, and the outcomes you see in public health. I mean, you've acknowledged that to an extent already. Um, so in evaluating success at the population scale, how will RISE Vermont demonstrate the share of public health trends that come from its efforts and not from other trends overall? I don't think you can. I, I don't, because it's, that's the muddy, that's the muddy nature of population and health and research is that we can't, there absolutely cannot be a separation between what RISE Vermont is doing um, and what other healthy behaviors one, you know, huge corporation is doing. Um, I think that the dose will help quantify what we're doing and then the penetrance throughout Vermont well, you, you know, can kind of help guide us. And I think that it only can be a guide as to whether we're making effective change. 
So I, there isn't there isn't really a good answer. I mean, if you have one, please <laughs> share. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, it's the ultimate. Um, you know, I mean, population health research is just so hard to quantify, and so we're trying to really do our best to quantify so that we can demonstrate efficacy. But on the other hand, we can't say that that's all rise Vermont. But it can spread, and as it does. I mean, we all know that certain, um, like obesity, is, is almost communicable, but, you know, in terms of the spread of um, obesity within communities and states and whatever, due to social determinants of health, cultural, all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, my main word with that is say, let's look at the St. Albans uh, children weight and height measurements over time, right? If that declines over a two-year period, can Rise Vermont claim that their efforts were a part of that? No, and we're not saying that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that that's not the intention of the study. Um, the intention of the study is to kind of help us, you know, so if the obesity rates decline, great. I think everybody gets to take credit for that. Um, but I guess it's the best way that we can actually objectively look at this in a scientific way and have some sort of evidence base behind what we do. Um, but you, I don't think that any effort, whether it's Rise Vermont, the Department of Health, you know, the gov you know, the United States government, I don't think any of them can really claim that. Um, and that's again what makes population health research so challenging. And uh, one final, oh, oh, my apologies. That's okay. Just. Um, I feel like what Rise Vermont has done is been a catalyst to get us all together. So the, the businesses and the schools and the town are now at the same table having conversations, all doing their piece. So it won't necessarily be Rise Vermont and its programs, but I feel like in our community, it's aligning people going in the same direction with a better chance of success. Right, excellent. Um, so the final question, I know we probably overshot time. Um, so Rise Vermont works with many partners in a project. You brought up the Windsor Walks example, bringing in these community consultants, different planning divisions, health advocates, all of that. How will Rise Vermont demonstrate the share of project outcomes that come from its efforts? Or how would it quantify that, show it's worth giving Rise Vermont more dollars, as opposed to all the efforts of the other partners, particularly for projects in which Rise Vermont is not the lead partner, or the lead uh, project leader? <laughs> I mean, I, th I think we've outlined today what we're, how we're trying to really track everything that we have some impact with, whether it's granting, because we've done the Amplified Grants, measuring, um, we look a lot at you know who our stakeholders are, who's coming to the table, and then we do very specifically measure through our dose calculation and also putting together our work plans, what work we've done, you know, very specifically like what has Alice done out in the community. But then after that, we're just trying to um, do the best measurement we can of things we've touched. And then after that, I think there'll be things we won't fully capture. Okay, other public comment? John. I'm Jonathan Billings um, from Northwestern Medical Center um, and one of the original founders of Rise Vermont and would like to thank the Green Mountain Care Board for their role as this spark has gone statewide. That there have been times over the years where we've received encouragement um, that moving towards a healthier future for all of Vermont um, is something that Vermont believes in and folks have encouraged us to, to keep going and to keep trying and to keep looking. And I think today you got to see that Vermont as a whole has embraced that and we're headed forward. And we're to change BMIs and to change population health and to change generational poverty and generational obesity takes time. And we have to have patience. Um, somebody said, you know, it takes 20 years to change obesity. I've been in my role at the hospital 30 years ago, 30 years. If we'd started 30 years ago, we'd have the real success that this group is looking for maybe 10 years ago. International research shows it's possible. These folks are on the right path. We've just got to continue. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay. Is there any other public comment? If not, is there any other business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Removed and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.